is very sick for once. So stay your distance from me. Probably should be teaching in a mask. Uh, but I don't have a mask on me. And my wife was texting me that she took him home early. And he's not feeling good. So stay away. Don't get whatever. I don't know. I probably have already had it. But All right. So today is the Meathead chapter. This is all about why we get bigger when we work out. So I say, so some come with us, like the, those guys that work out all the time, this is why they get so big, even though that's really not truly the only case, but that, you know, we'll roll with it. All right, so who benefits from resistance training of these groups? Man, you guys are, that was no fun. I was really hoping you guys were going to be like. Young would be before puberty, probably. I mean, it's really adorable to watch a five-year-old try to lift a little foam weights. I have a, a college friend that uh, he, his little one's probably I don't know, six months older than mine. And just watching him, because him and his wife are big fitness fanatics and doing CrossFit and those kind of things. So like in their garage, they have all this CrossFit equipment and this little kid's trying to do some of the same moves that dad's doing, trying to do burpees and stuff. And this kid's like, oh, as the kid, as he jumps and just super cute. Like, that young isn't really going to do any weight training, but... Uh, so, let's see. The, so, the myth used to be women should not train because they're going to look like a man. Definitely not the case. In fact, I probably are, it could be argued through some papers uh, that women actually gain more strength per pound than men do. So, like, from where a woman starts, like, if you test their, you know, bench press compared to six months of training to how much percentage of weight they gain in strength comparatively. There are some studies I have seen that actually say pound for pound, women gain more strength than men do. Men gain more weight from muscle mass, but actual strength, yeah, it could be the opposite. Uh, it used to be that if you, I've heard people say, uh, if you weight train before your, before puberty, you're going to stunt your growth. I think somebody asked me that in this class. I don't remember who. Uh, but that's also definitely not the case. In fact, it might even actually, you know, because you're putting strain on your bones, as they adapt to that strain, they might actually grow taller. So, again, not superly well. That one's not well studied as much as the girl's uh, strength. That one I've seen some better, some, I've seen multiple studies on. Uh, the other one is old men shouldn't uh, weight train because they're going to break a hip. Uh, definitely another one that's really not the case. I think I had a story. Let me read back here. Uh, there are de there's still some female co college coaches that still believe that their girls should never weight train. There are def some older people that definitely have that one. That's where I was. I'd say I knew there was one other one there. So resistance training. Say so. This is strength gains uh, via neuromuscular changes. So that's more than just the muscles. Uh, important for our overall fitness and critical for athletic training programs. So if you want to be better at your sport, you need to be lifting weights. Uh, I definitely, we had a guy last year that was telling me that his former teams before he got to PUC, they did 30 minutes of weights every day as a team. They're like, win or lose, we're still in the weight room tomorrow, is what the joke was. Uh, and he he was one that while I was teaching a class, I actually let him lift for 30 minutes next door uh, a couple times. He didn't do it all the time, but there were definitely days he went from my class and then I taught back to back. He's like, can I lift weights? I'm like, yeah, I'm close enough. If things were bad enough, I could watch them on the cameras. Uh, so after three to six months of resistance training, 
you're going to gain between 25% to 100%, so that'd be double of your, your strength gain. It would actually be pretty interesting to take the three weight training classes I've had and take their initial bench press to the last bench press and see how much they go up. Because I get a lot of beginners in there. This quarter, not so much. I probably have half of them are beginners. Uh, but last year's, my second and third quarters were almost all beginners. Uh, you can get similar strength gains um, as percentage of initial strength. So the greater the absolute gains for young men, uh, that for young women, older men, and children, I think that's still kind of up in the air there. Uh, and usually that's because of the muscle plasticity of males, which also has to do with the hormones of testosterone, generally speaking. So they have the phrase called hypertrophy. This is a word I don't know why I struggle to say this. I want to call it hypertrophy for some reason. But I, I, as I, so if I goof and say that a couple of times, please don't make fun of me too much for it. And then atrophy is when you don't do something. So that's why it's hypertrophy, hypertrophy or atrophy. So as you use the muscles, you'll gain strength. If you don't use the muscles, it goes down. We kind of said that. Say that's general. It's more complex, but that's just the gain thing there. Uh, generally, your strength gains is going to be muscle size. That's the one everybody wants. But what they don't realize, is, especially in a short 10-week program in the weight room here for a class, it's actually going to be mostly neural control that you're going to get strength gains from. Not, not very much actual muscle growth. Muscle growth usually comes after week 9 to 18. So between 2 months to 4 months, probably more like 6 months of training, is when you're going to really see the actual muscles grow. Uh, so here's a little data. So this would be, let's see, the world record for the snatch. So this would be what weight class they are, and how much they lift. So just so we know what the snatch is. I believe this goes all the way up to the top here. And that is, I believe, the actual world record of whatever her weight class is. I don't have it listed there. But what's interesting is the lower the weight class, the lower the world record is. So it kind of has a linear relationship to going up. Uh, same with the males. It goes up. The bigger the person, the more they can lift. It's just kind of an interesting one there. Nothing else on that one. So we get another one here. So this would be the cling and jerk. Same basic concept. So this would be cling to the chest. And then from there, they re-grip, and then they take it all the way up to the top. So another one, same concept, the weight class compared to how much they can lift. And this is all being kilograms, since most of the world is not on the imperial system like we are. But you can also note that the if you take like the highest weight, 220, 260, so they can lift more in this Olympic lift than the other. So this would be through 2016. So this would be an interesting one to see if it has changed in the last Olympics or be at least two Olympics. And probably by the time they republish this book, it'll be three Olympics. So how much has it gone up in the last three Olympics in comparative? Same concept here. This is for a different motion. And it's not telling me on there. Oh, total weight. This would be both of them combined. So both the cling and jerk and the uh, snatch. So both of these together would be the total weight, and that's what the world record is. That's why it's 450 plus for the men and 300 plus for the women. So that's it. I was saying earlier that a lot of your gains actually come from neurological control. So strength gains can't, can't occur without some neural uh, adaptations, uh, plasticity. So it can occur without 
any hypertrophy. So you're going to start, when you first start lifting in the weight room, after you haven't done it for a year or two, or maybe you never have at all, and the first day you're doing, uh, I see, I see some people in here, first day they can do 50 on the chest press machine over there. Well, by the end of week three, they're doing 70 or 80. And they're all impressed with themselves. And they're like, yeah, my muscles are getting bigger. I'm like, no, they're not. What's actually happening is they are learning to use more muscle fibers. So their brain is actually recruitment is what they call it, motor unit recruitment. So it's using more muscle fibers at now that it is having like, oh, well, oh, so I need to use more muscles, more fibers here to try to do this muscle. So it starts recruiting more fast twitch, starts recruiting more slow twitch ones. Try, and the more you do it, the more muscle fibers are going to be used. But eventually you get to the point where you can't recruit any more. And that's when you're going to, it's not, it's more complicated than that. But that's when the, your muscles then start actually growing. Uh, and then some other things of a hyperplasia. Well, we'll get to that. So motor units normally are recruited asynchronously, as in they aren't being recruited at the same time. So when I'm writing something, these are asynchronously going in order for me to have that fine motor control. If I'm doing a curl, they're not all going at exactly the same time. They're actually firing all through there, so they're all kind of going in different times to get that power. Well, the more you work them and the more you do the motions and the more you properly, keyword there, with proper technique, the more you'll start getting more synchronous recruitment, which is going to give you more strength gains. So that's going to make the contraction happen more forceful. It's going to improve the rate of force development, so how fast you can do them as well, and it improves the capability to have a recruit against that steady force. So resistance training, first thing it's going to do is start giving you synchronous recruitment of the muscle fibers, and that's how my people here in, we're in week four right now are telling me, I had two guys today telling me how much more they're lifting than they were the first day. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, and this is why, is they're actually getting more synchronous recruitment of their muscle fibers. And I pretty much just say that, so you're going to have a little more neural drive to get that nat natural contraction there. The frequency of that discharge, the rate coding that's telling it to do. Uh, and then you're actually going to then lower your inhibitory repulses. So when your body tells you, and I'm done, when you get too much, because you know, you, as your muscles start shaking as you're going up on your bench press there, that's the inhibitory impulses saying, this is too much, I'm quitting. Uh, so those actually lower the more you work, which tells your muscles that they can do more. So say those are kind of the three main ways that you're actually recruiting more, and this is before the muscles even get bigger. Uh, so it's likely that there's a combination of improved motor unit synchronicity and motor unit recruitment leads to straight gains. That's generally the start of it there. And we said a little bit of that motor rate coding. This is something that needs to be studied a little more, and this book's fairly old, so I would love to see the next version of this book, what they say about motor rate. Motor unit rate coding could be a nice journal there for somebody if you want to do something interesting. Uh, so it says limited evidence suggests that rate coding increases the resistance, um, especially in rapid movement and ballistic style trainings. So, so there's some autogenic inhibition. So this is the Golgi tendon organ. So that's the part when you get too far and it stretches so much that it can't stretch anymore. That's one of the autogenetic inhibitation is that tendon's like, nope, that's as far as my muscle can go. Those are the things that you goof, like when you hyperextend your knee like I did a couple days ago when I was refing. Uh, I had some Golgi tendons go, nope, that hurts. And then when I tried to run with the basketball players this morning, my knee's going, nope, 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 nope. So I only ran one lap outside and made them run five. Shame on me. Uh, so I say all those inhibitory things go down. Uh, say these are the ones that are going to keep your muscle from tending the tension going too high. 
Uh, the one I feel it the most is on the curls, uh, especially if you use that curl thing where you put it underneath your arms and you sit down. When you get to the point where it just stretches too much and you're just like, oh, wow, that's too much. I'm like, ah, on the next one, I'm going to make sure I go short of that point because I don't want that inhibitory thing to tell me, ouch, again. But the more you do it, the more range of motion you're going to start to gain as you keep working out. As I say, all those things go down. Uh, they also say that this could be some of those superhuman feats of strength. I should have had a video of this. I'm going to type that in here. of like parents when their kids trapped under a car lifting a car up like you've seen some of i've seen videos of parents doing that or and you're just like that shouldn't happen well that's they probably have the strength in them but there's inhibitory things telling them that they can't do that and when you get adrenaline and you want to save your child you're going to put every ounce of strength that you can and, and you ignore the parts of your body saying don't do that Come on. There we go. So there's a few other things there. You're going to have co-activation of the antagonist and agonist muscles. So that would be like your bicep is the agonist, your triceps the antagonist. So having those work together, that's just the easiest one, but there's different size of your legs, different parts. You're always going to have the agonist and antagonist things there um, and then your morphology morphing morphology of the neuromuscular juncture also are going to be ways that you're going to gain a little bit more take a standing break Oh, coffee number three, so necessary. Number three is crazy. Ooh, I've had a lot of water too. 545 comes really early. At least four days a week. I think we're going to do Monday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But that's because my Tuesdays have my wife has is helping another professor's family out in the morning. So I have my son at six in the morning. So, so even if he's asleep, I can't come to practice. As much as I would like to do it five days a week. That'd be my preference, but that's how it goes. All right, so muscle hypertrophy. This is where your muscles get bigger. So anytime we talk about hypertrophy, which we're gonna talk about it a lot in this class and then in other classes as well, uh, that is the muscle increasing in size. So there is the transient hypertrophy. So this would be right after a exercise bout. So this is why whenever you work out and you walk out of the gym and you walk up to the muscle, to the, uh, mirror and you look at how big your muscles have all of a sudden gotten. Spoiler alert. It's just fluids. It's making it look bigger. Give it an hour. It'll be gone. Uh, so that's usually due to edema, which is fluids. Um, edema is fluids or uh, swelling. So like when you roll your ankle and your ankle goes, that's edema is, a, is the actual technical term for it. Uh, generally, the edema is going to be in the plasma fluids of your blood, and that's why it goes there. Chronic hypertrophy is the what everybody wants. So that's where it's a long-term structural change in the muscle. So there's fiber hypertrophy. That's the muscle fiber is getting bigger. Fiber hyperplasia, we'll get to that one, or maybe both. So here is actually a microscopic view of a muscle. So this is, let's see, the first one is a guy who had not trained in two years. And let's see, if, where's this? The leg muscle of a man who has not exercised or not weight trained in two years uh, before he started training. And then this one is after six months of training. That's a pretty big difference in how big the individual muscle fibers are in his legs. And the different colors would be the different types of fibers. So you can also see there are a lot lighter ones. So there's more of the, whichever type. I forget which one was which there. Uh, but theirs would be, note the significantly larger fibers after training.
the obvious there. So that muscle, chronic mus muscle hypertrophy, which is what we all want, is maximized through high velocity eccentric training. So this is trying to keep it from going down really far. And usually when you're training somebody, you'll say, don't just let the muscles or the stuff drop. You want to lower it slowly. That's the eccentric training that's going to give you the most muscle building is actually in that part. It seems kind of backwards because you'd think that the concentric of pulling something up is what's actually giving you the most weight gain or the most muscles. It's actually the going down that's going to do the, it's actually doing it. So concentric training may limit muscle hypertrophy and strength gains. May, that's another one that'd be an interesting journal. Mm -hmm. I'm still not 100% sure what high velocity eccentric training is. Because that means trying to go fast on the lowering part. But yeah, like I need to look that one up what exactly that means. Uh, yeah. Let's say it disrupts the Z line as in it's going to start ripping things apart and we saw some of that in the marathon runner um, a few powerpoints ago where you saw how much the muscle was torn up after a marathon was over because uh, they took the leg thing so that's where the protein remodeling has to happen there so it stimulates uh by intensities as low as 30 percent and as high as 90 percent so when you're actually going for hypertrophy you're actually going for as i say we had that in yesterday's powerpoint uh, how many reps you're actually going for when you're trying to build muscle is actually like 6 to 15, if I remember right, or 6 to 10 or 12 or something like that. Strength gains is when you're going for that 2 to 6, if you're trying to get the absolute most strength. So, yeah. So it's caused by both high rep, wide, and low rep training, depending on, I can say both can do the same, can give you some muscle hypertrophy. So more myofibrils, more actin and myosin filaments, more sarcoplasm, more connective tissue. Basically, everything goes up. So the more resistance training is going to be more protein synthesis. And that's all the things that are going to repair your muscles. That's why people want to eat a lot of protein when they're uh, trying to go for hypertrophy. Big protein diets there. Uh, I don't have it up here, but when I in my health classes, I used to show the ROCKS training um, meal by meal, he would eat 11 meals a day uh, when he was working out for, I think it was Hercules was the movie that he was working on at the time. So it's a fairly old movie, but his workout and his eating habits were pretty interesting. He's like, yep, I get up in the morning, first thing I do, an hour of cardio. And he's like, and I got, he, here's my bed, here's my treadmill. He was like, right, he was in his hotel room. He's like, then I would eat meal number one. And it was just, he's like, it would all come prepackaged in some small little thing like this, which was probably more like that, but he's a really tall guy. He's like 6'6", six, six, if I remember right, 6'5". All right, so your fiber hypertrophy um, is facilitated by testosterone. That's why men grow muscles faster than women's, because they have testosterone in their body. Uh, and also is the reason that women won't end up looking like a man when they exercise a lot. Uh, I have a former uh, basketball, volleyball gymnast of mine that's up at Walla Walla. She's actually doing exercise science to be a PT. Uh, but she's gotten into all this Instagram, putting videos of herself exercising all the time. And when she does her cuts and she advertises the whole thing. Uh, but it's been interesting because she's lifting six days a week probably. And I'm like, and there's an example of why you are not going to look like a man. The only time a woman's going to start looking like a man is if they start taking some sort of testosterone, then yes, that, aka steroids, because that's pretty much the main thing that is going to be in any steroid, but we'll get to that another day. Uh, so the other things that are going to happen, your body is going to give you more growth hormone to repair the muscles. You're going to have insulin growth factor one, IGF-1, that's a protein. Um, it's elevated in post-level exercise levels are not required for anabolism and strength. So hyperplasia is another side of this. So they haven't done this on people because it's not superly ethical because you would be like taking 
lots of muscle biopsies and taking a whole chunk out of your arm to look at it. So it's not really the most cost efficient and most probably not the most ethical thing to be doing all the time. But they did this in some cats and they had this cat figured out that if I push on this thing and they made it weighted, that if I push on this, I get a treat. And they would keep pushing on it every day, more and more and more. And what they checked was, did they gain muscle size or did they actually get more muscle fibers? So did they grow new fibers or are the fibers just getting bigger? Hyperplasia is more muscle fibers. So that's where I say they're not 100% sure if humans have this or not because it's not really ethical to be doing that. Uh, but they have seen some differences um, in the in cats, mice, and rats. As in, the more they exercise, the more actual muscle fibers they have. As I, I'm guessing, they have to actually like kill them and then count them. Is how they would do that. So it's like more than a muscle biopsy. That's why they haven't done it in humans. That's my guess. Don't quote me on that. Then here's kind of where they had, it's a little better. So they had pushed the lever with however much weight it was, and then it would drop food down on them. And yeah, that's how they would feed the animal. That's how that was all done. So heavy resistance training in cats. That's how they did it. So humans, most hypertrophy is due to the fiber hypertrophy, as in it gets bigger. Uh, fiber hyperplasia also probably contributes to it, but fiber hypertransia versus hypertrophy versus hyperplasia may depend on the type of resistance training or the load. Higher intensity tends to cause more type 2 hypertrophy. So our hyperplasia can't may occur, but we don't know exactly how or why. We're assuming that it happens, but it's just not well studied because it's not really the best way to, thing to do. So what, they, what they're wondering, and I think I had something on this here in the cats. Where was it? So muscle strength training due to producing more fibers. Each half grows to the size of the parent fiber. So they were thinking that the muscle fibers actually split into two. And so that's what they're talking about here is that it can occur through fibers actually splitting into two separate fibers. And as a, a fiber can run the whole length of your, say the longest one goes from your hip to your knee. This is the longest fi muscle fiber in your body. So they wonder if that could actually be part of your satellite cells. It could be activated by stretches or injuries. Uh, they, they just aren't 100% sure how it happens, but we just know that it probably happens. That's pretty much all we can say at this point. So this is what they're saying. The satellite cells um, due to a muscle injury. So you'd have satellite cells are activated. They come to the injured fiber that you tore while you were working out. And these start attaching, and they start adding to and adding to. They then eventually grow into the muscle, and then eventually it gets a little bit bigger. And some of them turn into a myofiber or a myonuclei, and so there's some of the technical t stuff that goes on there. I would make sure you understand all of this, uh, at least to a point. I think I have a video of it here. I don't know if it's going to work, but we'll give it a click and see if it works. Chronic hypertrophy results from an increase in the size of existing Thousand individual years. muscle fibers known as fiber hypertrophy and, and may in some cases involve an increase in the number of muscle fibers or fiber hyperplasia. Satellite cells, which are the myogenic stem cells involved in skeletal muscle regeneration, are part of this process. These cells are typically activated by the stretching and injury to the muscle fiber that can result from intense training. Text. Satellite cell activation and proliferation. A group of satellite cells activated by muscle injury appears to the left of the muscle fiber. A red arrow points to the label muscle injury. A black I think that's the girl talk is supposed to be like descriptive audio. It was trying to describe the picture. Which I thought that was going to actually go through the whole thing there, but. Uh. 
All right, so the, me the two mechanisms that you're going to have is the neural activation to get, gain strength, is neural activation of more fibers, and then the hypertrophy of the muscles getting bigger. So in the short term, you're, you're going to gain a big substantial one rep max right away. And then that's what those guys were telling me in class um, the other day. Say so the neural factors are going to be pretty critical in that first eight to ten weeks. Long-term stuff is where you're going to have your significant long-term chronic uh, hypertrophy. Uh, also, the, and when that's all going on, you're going to have more protein synthesis. That's why you want to eat more protein. And that high hypertrophy is going to be a major factor after 10 weeks of training. So the longer you work out, the more muscles. It's going to take you at least 10, 8 to 10 weeks before you're going to actually get some. When you can finally go up to the mirror and look at your muscles and be like... And that's sticking around. Now, the same concept as yesterday. When you reduce activity or cease to have any activity, the major changes in the muscle structure and function. Uh, they've done this with like limb immobilization studies. So like when someone breaks an arm uh, and you look at their arm after it comes out of a cast and you look at each arm and one's like bigger and one's way skinnier. Uh, I don't know if anybody's broken an arm or a leg and had it in a cast. What happens when they take the cast off? So I had my leg in a, or my ankle in a cast for six weeks. Uh, they, I was, it was so weird because I walked into the specialist this would be like the sports medicine doctor i walked in there and i got a pa so i wasn't 100 percent sure if he knew what he was doing or not because he read my mri results and it said crack in the tibular and calcaneus muscle or bones which is where the ankle knob on the inside runs into the foot bone and apparently those were fractured and so he said, oh, fractured, you need, a, we're going to put you in a cast today. I'm like, what? I mean, I walked in. I had been doing basketball. I had been teaching gymnastics. I'm like, I need a what? And he's like, yep, and you're going to be off of it for, he's like, I'll see you in three weeks. I didn't even have any crutches to get out the door. So I'm like, how am I going to walk out of here? And they're like, oh, we'll send you downstairs. And they put me in a wheelchair and I wheeled myself down to the fit, or the PT area, which was downstairs at the sports medicine place. It was an awesome facility. And they gave me some crutches. I had to pay for them through insurance. And I hobbled out the door and I'm like, okay, how am I going to shower with this thing on my foot? Like I had all these questions, like I did not plan for this. So I went back three weeks later, they put it back on and I looked at it. So after six weeks of being off of my ankle, they still ended up doing ankle surgery. But you could totally see the difference between my calf muscle on one side and my calf muscle on the other. And that was in six weeks. I, I know there's people that have done longer times in cast than that, but I was like, wow, what a difference. And I still walked into my uh, ankle surgery on two feet because they actually it was technically in a boot. I actually went through my son's birth in a boot. Uh, and that was just because the doc's like, well, apparently the, because uh, we did another MRI, apparently staying off of it for six weeks didn't help. I'm like, I could have told you that. But I was like, it hurts worse than that. So that's how, that's my story of immobiliz immobilization. It was just looking at the size of my calves was just totally different. And so there can be some major muscle changes after six hours. So if you sit on a long drive, there are some lack of muscle use. Protein synthesis goes down. This is also some of those things we were talking about when you sit for too long during a day, some of the same concepts here. So if you do this for a long time, in that first week, you're going to lose 3 to 5%. Uh, there are some reversible effects on your type 1 and type 2 fibers there. Uh, it can lead to, obviously, a drop in your 1 rep max of whatever you were doing. Uh, loss of strength can be regained in about six weeks, and that's probably about right. When I finally got back on my leg again, about six weeks later, I could probably do pretty much the same thing as I could, and I didn't. Have, I couldn't actually work out, so this would be just walking around. Uh, I mean, I had it in a boot when I went to work, but when I got home, I took that boot off and walked around like it normal. 
Uh, but still, it took a little while to, they didn't actually give me any like PT to like work me back into it when this one had on that first one uh, before surgery. Oh, uh, see, changes in the mean cross-sectional areas for major fiber types over resistance training in women over training periods of longer ones. So, so before, after, and then before six weeks before, six weeks after. So this would be 20 weeks before, 20 weeks after. So this is how the muscle cross-section that they measured out. So this is how many of each types of fibers they saw. So it's pretty, quite a bit in that 20-week program there. And then six-week wasn't too bad. Quickly, standing break. And then I got eight slides. Long enough for me to get a sit. All right, keeping going. So you can also have, there's a, we, we touched on this just a, a little bit there, is the different types of fibers. Uh, so your type 2 fibers become more oxidative uh, with anaerobic training. Your type 1 fibers are more anaerobic with anaerobic training. Uh, I did a bunch of anaerobic stuff with my basketball players this morning. And then I did running outside for aerobic training. So we did kind of both there for our stuff upstairs. Uh, you would actually do cross sections of some different type of chronic low frequency simulation or other ways that you can. That's what we're saying about when they connect the things there and it makes your muscles do this on purpose. Some of that can do. Some of it can be reversed under these conditions. Uh, and then the best one is treadmills and resistance trainings are going to do the most. So the type 2X to type 2A, remember X are the, are the fastest twitching ones. So that transition's fairly common. In a 20-week heavy resistance training program, static strength cross-sectional area goes up, like the pictures we saw earlier. Uh, the percentage of type 2X go down, and the type 2A go up. So you, you actually lose some of the quick, fast twitch muscles uh, so some people say, I can't jump as high now that I've started working out. And that is partially true to that. I would say they need to add some more plyometrics if that actually is important to them. And then there's some other studies here that talk about that. We're going to keep on going. So your diet. Uh, so reduce your training and diet. So you're going to want to consume 20 to 25 grams of protein after your resistance exercises for muscle growth. So however you need to do that, beans and rice for a vegetarian, uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, because the peanut butter and the uh, wheat have a full protein. Most people, though, that are not vegetarian, they just eat meat. But you want to have good meat as best you can, so that's why a lot of them are doing like fish. It has a lot of protein in it in the muscles that you're eating there. Uh, the number that they say is 1.6 to 1.7 grams of protein per kilogram. So you'd have to actually measure yourself into kilograms and everything. Small doses every couple, three hours. That's why The Rock, when he was trying to grow the muscles as big as he could, had 11 meals a day. So every two to three hours, he was eating something all day long. Larger doses are recommended immediately after. And there's that same video. So here's all the protein numbers here. So you're going to have repeated muscle strips are going to increase your IGF-1 proteins. And then there's this mTOR here. We'll talk about that another day. Uh, so those are all the things that you're getting from your protein that you're eating. So these have to be, I believe the TOR is one that has to be eaten. So that's why it's on, listed on here. All the other things here, insulin, growth factor, amino acids are coming from the protein as well. Uh, descriptive dictates the transcription of your messenger RNA, which is the same things they made the COVID vaccine out of, was messenger RNA. Insulin's going to happen there. Translations are going there. Got to keep going. And here's how that all happens. So resistance training, muscle overstretches. All these proteins end up happening from the intercellular things there, which is going to also increase the protein synthesis, which causes the muscles to get bigger. Oversimplified in a picture, but that's kind of what it is. Here's a little different version of the same thing. <coughs> And we just don't have time to go into all the details here, but there's the insulin having that go across. All the channels are going to allow more things to transport. Leucinine is going to end up there, that mTOR that we were just talking about. Some different acids, all amino acids going back and forth into phosphoric acid. 
And all these things together are going to make more protein muscles here. And lysosome, yeah, this is a fascinating process, which I would have shown you this video um, if we have enough time, but we don't. <clears throat> I already kind of went over this one, so we're going to keep going. Uh, definitely a major thing to think about the older your clients are or the older you get, the more they're going to benefit from resistance training. The older you get, the more you should be doing resistance training compared to cardio. If you want to maintain your body, having it under load, under weight, and it doesn't even have to be big weights. Uh, you know, they can be doing the 20 to 25 reps type of things, uh, but that's going to keep them body healthier longer uh, the older they get. And it doesn't matter any gender, race, all of those are all going to be uh, better in adults. And it's going to be mostly neural adaptations. It's mostly maintaining the neural network of your muscles. The more you sit around and watch an old people in nursing homes that they just kind of wheel them in front of a TV or a big screen thing there watching sports, uh, that's bad. They're going to deteriorate because they're not using those muscles. They're also not using their brain, but that's another topic. And here's all the other things that go down. Keeping that protein synthesis or eating enough protein, uh, the mTOR signaling in the brain. Last one. Uh, make sure you're doing resistance training in your sports is really what it comes. The hard part is, is it takes time because you only have so many hours in the day and you can only have so many practices and the higher up level you get, the more it's restricted on exactly. I mean, I only have to deal with the little high school stuff here where like, all right, for the two weeks before the season starts, you can't do any actual basketball training. You can only do conditioning. And this is all because they used to just have captain led practices for those two weeks rather than so there's no coach could be present, which I know some of our college teams are doing right now, which is totally legal. Uh, but as a taking the time to purposely t spend time in the gym uh, when you get to like a division one place, they only have so many hours they're even allowed to practice. So giving up that practice time for weight resistance training, it, as a coach, you just have to balance that out. Uh, training results should be tested with sport specific performance matrix and we'll talk about that if you take fitness assessment. I'm done a minute early. It doesn't happen often.